Hello and welcome to the Prince Soft Cover. Today we are joined by uh, retired IAS officer Mr. Sanjeev Chopra to talk about uh, his latest book, We the People of the States of Bharat. And here is the book. Let's just uncover it first. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. I have also ordered the book. Yes. So, sir, uh, let us uh, start the conversation with the idea. So, this is clearly, I have read the book. So, this is clearly uh, a work of history. And uh, you have been an IS officer, a very senior bureaucrat. You have served in various capacities in states, also across ministries. So, how did you, you know, get the idea of writing you know, such a book? Because it involves a lot of research and i mean lot lot of study yes in fact as i mentioned in the book you know this was not planned in that manner it's just that i had gone to the office of the survey of india and i was then the director of the academy and i just happened to accompany uh, the 2020 batch somewhere in the middle of february because they have their uh, settlement training in our time settlement training was all done in the states but now that survey of india has so many new techniques of surveying the land and mapping the territories. So I just decided to go with them. And while, you know, uh, this training was going on, so I just happened to visit their uh, museum. And in the museum, I saw the first map of India that was published in 1796 by an organization, the Survey of Bengal, because at that time, the Survey of Bengal was the institution. And then I started looking at so many maps of India. And I, and I realized that, you know, Every time the borders of the country, I mean, the internal boundaries of the of first the East India Company changed, and then after 1947, there were so many maps. You know, there are about uh, at least 75 to 80 times when the when the internal boundaries of this country have been renamed. So I am saying sometimes you know the borders change, sometimes the name change. For example, when the name is changed from Mysore to Karnataka, the Survey of India has to prepare a new map. Uh, when you change even the even the uh, the nomenclature, for instance, uh, in the case of Lakadiv, Amandivi, and uh, Miniko Islands, the entire group of islands was called Lakshadiv. So when this happened again, the Survey of India is asked to produce a new map. So I started looking at all the maps which the Survey of India has produced. So many of them. So the um, Survey General of India uh, had become a good friend by this time. So I told him, "You please give me all these maps." So I collected all these maps and put them in my study and my library. Uh, and then I was just, just observing these maps. And then, you know, I started comparing uh, the changes that were made in the map of 1947 to the map of 1950. Then you see the first Hindi map came out in 1952. So I started looking at that map. Then I started looking at the map of 1953, 1956, and so on. So each map was telling a story. And uh, so when I started comparing the differences or the changes that took place between the map of India in 1947 to the map of India in 1950, it told many, many, many stories. And these stories had not been, I mean, all these stories exist because the fact is that none of the things that I've done is, is that's not original research. It is all based on secondary sources, but all these were in various places. You know? So all these were in various places. So, uh, you know, the advantage of being the director of the academy is that you have access to a wonderful library. I mean, our library is uh, very well stocked, especially it's so well stocked in so far as states is concerned, because every officer trainee is also expected to write a state paper. So we have a lot of material. Uh, so I think it was the best place, perhaps after the Nehru Memorial or the, you know, I mean, other than the Nehru Memorial, I think ours is the most well stocked library in so far as the reorganization of Indian states is concerned. So that's how it started. And once it starts, you know, then the process takes a life of its own. I, I never thought I'll end up uh, writing a complete book on that, but then there's so many interesting things. You know, for instance, <clears throat> earlier used to, it was all in miles. You know, then around 1956, we changed over to the kilometer system. So in fact, in two, two maps of India, earlier in the first map of India, everything is in miles. 
And these days, everything is in kilometers. But for about four or five years, you refer to the distance both in terms of miles and in terms of kilometers. So there are so many interesting stories which are woven into the maps. If you look at each map uh, very carefully. Uh, so that's how the, the, the journey started. And I've always been fascinated with maps because you get very good map. You, you get 100% if you know your map well. If you're a student of history or geography, you know, you, you, got, you could max your marks in maps. I was always fond of maps. <laughs> That's how it started and it continued like this. Okay. Also, the, uh, you know, the title of this book uh, is very interesting. We, the people of the states of Bharat. Generally, you know, we, we all know about we, the people of Bharat, we, the people of India. So, we, the people See, of, we, uh, of Bharat. Uh, you, know, the, you know, because the subtitle again is the making and remaking of India's internal India's boundaries. Internal boundaries you know, yes. So one is that Bharat that is India or India that is Bharat and Bharat. names interchange. Uh, the other aspect is you see that uh, if you look at the first map of India, 1947, it said provinces, states and districts of India. Because in 1947, what we now call states were called provinces. provinces. And the princely states were called states. So Hyderabad was called a state. Jammu Kashmir was called a state, Mysore was called a state, right? Bombay was called a province, Madras was a province, Punjab was a province. So this is one distinction that when we got our first map in 1950, then the map said states under the new constitution of India. So that's how the title, you know, came up. In fact, the title that I was working with was uh, mapping the Indian states, uh, aspirations, assertions and adjustments. Because I felt that, you know, every ethnic and linguistic community in this country has aspired for a reorganization on ethnic or linguistic lines. And each one of them has sort of uh, aspired for it. Each one of them has asserted for it, sometimes violently also. And then everyone has adjusted because no one has got exactly what it wanted. I mean, Punjabi Suba is not what Punjabi Suba, what the adherents of Punjabi Suba wanted. You know, there's still the dispute between Maharashtra and Karnataka is going on. The entire Northeast, you have the, you have a Nagaland, but Nagaland is not fully satisfied with Nagaland because they want certain other areas. Likewise with Manipur. So there is not one state in the country which is completely satisfied as well. So the process of adjustment, I mean, Haryana would want certain areas, Punjab wants, so, and it's true for every state. There is not one state in the country, which is what one can say, I mean, of course, there are differences, I mean, there's a variation of degrees, but everyone aspired, everyone asserted, and then everyone adjusted. So that was the working title, but then uh, uh, my publisher and I, we thought that this is a better title, so that's how we went about it. And sir, your, uh, the, this book, I mean, I was reading the chapters and also, it's a very fine, it's, it's a nice narration of... Uh, you know, uh, the stories and how you chronicled the, the events and, you know, connecting dots. So uh, there are some issues which is very relatable even now. Like one is uh, you have mentioned about Hindi as Raj Bhasha and how it was to happen but did not happen and how it did not happen and how we are still struggling. And you have also written that this is this is a kind of an issue that keeps, you know, coming back to us. Well, yes, I'm sitting so, in. Uh, yeah, one more thing so that you can elaborate on both. So, another thing, sir, uh, about the because your book is about boundaries, I mean, state boundaries, the internal boundaries. So, we are still struggling with boundaries. Like, there is this Maharashtra Karnataka boundary issue, there is this another issue in Northeast, which often turns very violent. So, if you can elaborate this struggle and how we are still, you know, trying to reorganize, trying to reinvent ourselves. Well, it's, it's always a continuous process. I mean, it's always a continuous process. There are no, there are no finalities ever, you know, because what happens is that, you know, demographics keeps changing. And because demographics change, you know, people's uh, views change. And, and in fact, as more and more people enter into a particular area, the demographics will change. A very stark example is that of Sikkim, because that's a very illustrative example, because the entire demographics of Sikkim had changed when the Nepalese became a majority over there. Now, again, you see, there is a, uh, you know, this this dispute and this conflict between Maharashtra and Karnataka or between, uh, or at the border regions, because there is always, at the, at, the, at the border, there's always that tension because there's, you know, because in the heart of Maharashtra, 
it is clear that marathi is spoken mm. in the heart of karnataka kannad would be spoken but somewhere along the border this problem or if you call it a problem i think it's a problem because we invest a lot of politics in it you know because nothing prevents us from from and today with with all these facilities for translation all these facilities for multilingual schools i mean this is a problem which is tractable but a lot of times problems uh, are not resolved because it helps to not resolve problems uh, let's be you know uh, the statement that i am trying to make is that a lot of times problems are solvable i mean you can easily have two languages uh, in in a particular district that's eminently possible say for example in 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 bengal uh, all the work in darjeeling is done in uh, in in in, in nepali stroke gurkhali as they okay. like call it uh, uh, lepcha is recognized as a language you know so it's not that you know you cannot find solutions to it the problems happen if for instance in darjeeling an insistence would be made that nothing would be done in bangla or if the insistence was made that everything will be done in gurkhali or that everything will be done so the problem is when you want everything done in one particular thing you see one of the reasons why uh, the mizo national front and why the why meghalaya and all the others you know that was because uh, in 1960 the chief minister of assam was 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 so you know ambitious about wanting to make assami is the sole language of assam now if you did not want to make it the sole language of assam and you had accommodated the other languages you know then perhaps things would have been different again uh, in 1965 you mentioned about this linguistic uh, agitation that mr shastri had to face and before that also there was a major agitation it was the insistence on the removal of english and the insistence on hindi being the only official language that now the fact is that today we have 22 official languages in the country and 17 of them are represented on our currency note right so therefore the more uh, liberal we are uh, the more uh, open we are about language about identity it will be better for us you see one of the thing which i want to mention is that you know compared to in fact when the india bangladesh cricket match was happening mm-hmm. they were just looking at the national anthem both incidentally are written by tagore so in their case it is amar sonar band in our case it is punjab sindh gujarat maratha dravid uttar pradesh right so all these ethnic uh, identities are included in our in our in our national anthem all of them is part of it so there is no problem whatsoever and that is the strength that is the biggest strength of our country that we include all and it is part of our mandate it is part of our part of our growing up so everyone who sung the national anthem in this country Uh, knows that it's fine I and mean, you can be a good and that's exactly also the speech of anna durai when he said in 1962 that i am a dravidian you are a bengali you are a gujarati we we are all we should all be proud of our own identities and yet our identity does not mean that we are not bharat or that we are not india so that's the point which i like to make right also sir you have uh, brought in uh, interesting details about jammu and kashmir jammu kashmir ladak uh, also how the you know king i mean raja hari singh how he handled kashmiri muslims when there was his resentment and how he you know formed an inquiry commission to it, it was uh, probably again about language and about tradition and all if you can elaborate on that a bit the first thing that we got to understand is that uh, the name which jammu kashmir had given to itself was jammu wa kashmir wa tibet wa ladakh so they had actually thought that they are uh, they are a kingdom with four provinces and each of these four were ethnically apart linguistically apart and yet <clears throat> all our claims on the on the visa vi sky chain and all this is based on this configuration of geography uh, which maharaja hari singh had now one of the thing which i want to share with you is that you see the as far as kashmir is concerned <clears throat> there are two, there are three or four main players who should be mentioned maharaja hari singh of course was the maharaja and in many senses uh, the the sovereign i mean the quasi sovereign because uh, he had accepted the the suzerainty of the of the of the queen of england now <clears> or <throat> the king of england that time now the other major player is sheikh mohammad abdullah Now, Sheikh Muhammad Abdullah was not just a Kashmiri Muslim leader. He had become, or rather, after the 1938 session of the Indian National Congress, uh, which was chaired by Subhash Bose, he had been elected to chair the All India States People's Congress. 
Right. Mm -hmm. So all the Praja Sabhas, all, all the Praja Mandal, not just of Jammu Kashmir, but of Hyderabad, of Bhopal, of Patiala, all these uh, <coughs> Praja Mandals, which were the Congress outfits in the princely states, they were all affiliated. And Muhammad Abdullah was becoming a pan-Indian Muslim leader. Mm -hmm. Now, I must place on record that Mr. Jinnah did not like either Sheikh Muhammad Abdullah or the Nizam of Hyderabad. Because in Mr. Jinnah's configuration of things, he wanted to be the sole spokesman. And the two people whom he hated the most in the country were not Patel and Nehru and Mahatma Gandhi. They were Nizam of Hyderabad and Sheikh Muhammad Abdullah. So while at the, the biggest resistance to Jammu Kashmir being part of Pakistan came from both uh, Jinnah and from Sheikh Muhammad Abdullah. You see, the Maharaja uh, was... Almost, I mean, he, he he was in a double mind. At that time, his prime minister, Mr. Kak, uh, was, I mean, they had nearly agreed. And Mr. Jinnah had told the, this Maharaja, also the Maharajas of Jodhpur and Bikane, that why do you want to join India? Because if you join India, it is a democratic republic. So you will lose all your rights and privileges over a period of time because India is committed to democracy. Mm -hmm. I am not. You can retain all your rights, all your feudal privileges, all your 21 gun salute status and whatever, whatever, whatever. And he had given a blank check to, I mean, blank check in the sense that he had told that you still like, unlike the instrument of accession, which the which uh, had been drafted by the Ministry of States, which Sadar Patel had given to the 562 provinces, Mr. Jena said, you, you decide your instrument of accession. Right. So the reasons why Jammu Kashmir and Hyderabad were not part of Pakistan is also because Mr. Jinnah did not want it. Now, Mr. Jinnah was not in complete control of Pakistan also because the, the other leaders of Pakistan thought differently. But that's a long chapter. So, so the, the story of Jammu Kashmir is, is a very interesting story. It's got um, uh, Maharaja Hari Singh. It's got... Uh, Jinnah, it's got Sheikh Muhammad Abdullah, it's got the personality of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. So a lot of factors go into this. So it's not a very simple, uh, you know, it's not a very simple uh, story. It's a fairly complex story. Yeah, Kashmir is not even complicated. It's complex. It's very complex. So uh, also, but like uh, like whatever you said, that means that Jinnah, it, it was about the political conflict that Jinnah had with these two leaders. And uh, Kashmir is primarily kind of a result of that political conflict and maybe... Yes, maybe. Kashmir's story goes back. I mean, and the fact is that, you see, uh, it's a... I mean, it's very difficult. We need a separate session on this. <laughs> because, one, there is so much material on Jammu Kashmir. There's so much material that is still coming out in Jammu Kashmir. Uh, but the fact remains, the fact remains that, you see, uh, there are many things. One is about what happened till the instrument of accession, which, which took place three months later, because unlike the rest of the country, only three states, Junagar, <clears throat> Jammu Kashmir and Hyderabad, had not signed the instrument of accession till the 14th or 15th of August. All the five, the remaining 559 princely states had signed the IOA. Only three were left, Junagar, Jammu Kashmir and Hyderabad. So because this happened after three months, it happened on the August 26th and 27th, and that was the time when the Maharaja had left, was left with no option. Right. Mm -hmm. So the major controversies about Kashmir, about Jammu and Kashmir, are two. One is on the date of accession that we delayed it. I mean, it could have happened earlier because the Maharaja could have... And second, or the more contentious issue is, where, why did we, why did our forces not march on? Right, there are many views on this. One view on this is also that Muhammad Abdullah, Sheikh Muhammad Abdullah never wanted that part of Kashmir over which his national conference did not have too much control. And that would be true for any political leader at any point of time. So uh, I don't think Sheikh Muhammad Abdullah was an exception. I mean, he did what he thought what was happening and the rest of course is history because then Jammu Kashmir has got involved in the vortex of, of, of international politics. So now it's a, it's a very, but let, let me also place on record that the, that the, the defense of India in the United Nations, the best defense was made by Sheikh Muhammad Abdullah. And on the side of Pakistan, it was made by Sir Zabrullah Khan who was an Ahmadiyya. And in today's context, uh, uh, I mean, they don't even recognize Sir uh, Zafrullah Khan. Although Zafrullah Khan had made a great defense from the Pakistan side, and Jinnah, and uh, sorry, and Sheikh Muhammad Abdullah had made the defense on the Indian side. 
and today uh, i mean both of them are uh, are considered uh, i mean are not held in very high esteem by either, by either country so history has some very interesting twists and turns you know uh, about this but uh, i mean i have been looking at it purely on the basis of documents that were that are available in the public domain right also this book has uh, some very interesting chapters like how uh, tibet disappeared and china appeared and uh, oh, yes. yeah that's that's something which i'm very fond of yes, telling everybody yes, yes. you know that i even i even i didn't realize it it's just that when i was looking at the map of india i mean all the previous maps i mean i couldn't cover everything because you know the uh, one of the problems is that uh, it's difficult to put so many maps in one book but you know 1952 the hindi map was the first time that the word chin appears on our map before mm-hmm. that 47 the area above was called undefined territory and in all the british maps of the maps which the britishers had produced and they were in power they never used the word china on their map they always used the word tibet or undefined territory and i must explain to you one of the things as you see there is a difference between the concept of border and the concept of a frontier hmm. you see border is very well defined whereas a frontier is an area which may not be very well defined right so the britishers had this notion that there must be fixed borders and fixed boundaries where you have populations and where there is complete you know where there is where revenue has to be collected and then there are frontier areas you know which are far out there which is a kind of a buffer so in the british conception there is a difference between a frontier region and an actually inhabited region where you need to have well defined borders you know and this is something which uh, uh, lord curzon explained in 1906 at the boys memorial lecture in in oxford so you know while researching i came across some of these things uh, which i'm um, so to understand how the british mind was looking at things and i remember that in 1906 i mean they never thought that they'll ever leave india in 1906 the british were so you know was so confident about their ability to go on and on and on and on and on so uh, i mean the arrogance uh, and the hubris which developed i mean by the time uh it who nobody could have thought in 1906 that another four decades and the british would be out of this country so uh sir uh, did you reach any conclusion after you know reading and uh, doing research uh, across libraries okay, let's put it like this the word i would use is not conclusion because historians cannot conclude mm-hmm. uh, that's something which i leave it to other people but there are some lessons some very clear lessons and pointers that 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 have emerged after two and a half years of study uh, the first is that you know there is a notion of identity and this notion of identity is fluid so when i say it's fluid it means that it is neither cast in stone nor is it all gas for example take the case of uttarakhand before uttarakhand was made people were identifying themselves as kumaunis and gadwalis mm. right now that uttarakhand is made there is a new uttarakhandi identity or oh, there is an identity as a punjabi there is an identity as belonging to delhi now these are all fluid identities right uh, but they are not cast in stone so identities evolve second is that language is usually a divisive force the exception being punjabi because script can also be a major element of division and punjabi uh, if, as you are aware is written in three scripts the devanagari script the gurumukhi script and the shahmukhi script which is the the urdu script second is that there is a considerable difference in the way pan indian political parties that is the congress and the bjp and earlier the communist party would look at issues and the way regional parties look at things for example uh, when we come to the uh, to india's relations with bangladesh or the sharing of tista waters the position which the congress and bjp have is very different from the position which the which the tmc has or cutting across party lines the position which the cm of punjab would have as far as relations with pakistan is concerned is different from what the national political parties would would want to have because these are different interests third is that political parties change their perspectives with time uh, at the time of uh, you know at some point of time uh, the bjp or earlier avatar jansangh they were not in favor of small states now they have changed their opinion fourth migration affects demography demography affects politics and it's a process but that process finally casts its spell on politics the case of sikkim is there for us to see fifth 
there's a gap between what the national leadership of a party may want and what the ground level workers do. And take the case of Punjab and Chandigarh and see the Congress party was committed to giving Chandigarh to Punjab. But in Haryana, they could not give this argument and they could not, could not hand over Chandigarh to Punjab because of elections in Haryana. And even today, even today, the BJP or the Congress or no party in Haryana would be willing to publicly accept the view of the government of India that Chandigarh ought to go to Punjab. Because the ground level, what the ground level workers want could be very different from what the national leadership of a party may want. In the case of uh, Bombay, for example, at that point of time, all the three top political parties in the government, and not top, but I would say uh, the, the electorally uh, significant parties, the Congress and the Communist Party of India, and the BJP did not want Bombay uh, to be divided into Gujarat and Maharashtra, but the ground level workers wanted. Therefore, cutting across party lines, they had created the, the SMM, the Sanyukt Maharashtra Morcha. Seven, the English language press, the Hindi press, and the regional press have very different perspectives, especially when it comes to language issues. Uh, next, that the opposition to an idea can come from the most unexpected quarters. You know, for example, when Bengal and Bihar wanted to merge and become one state, the opposition came from the Communist Party, that was acceptable, that was understandable, but the opposition also came from the UP Congress. So the UP Congress felt that that is the end of the hegemony, permanent hegemony or permanent control of UP on the politics of this country, right? And then uh, the uh, this every story has many perspectives. And last but not the least, the statement that I wish to make is that while as individuals we count our life in decades, for nations we have to count our life in centuries. And when it comes to civilizational perspective, we have to look at millennia. So these are some of the broad uh, lessons that I have got from this study. Okay. okay, sir, very nice. Thank you. And very uh, nicely you have explained everything to me and to our viewers. I uh, hope they read this book. And thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Mother Prun. Thank you to the print. Okay.